Hello, bienvenue. I welcome you to the Psychology of Global Crisis Conference hosted by the American University of Paris. This is the keynote address of Professor Corinne Squire. I am Maria Medved, Professor of Psychology, and as many of you know, one of the co-organizers of this conference. I will be moderating this session. Corinne Squire is Professor of Social Sciences and co-director of the Center for Narrative Research at the University of East London. She is also a research associate at the Witwatersrand University in South Africa. Her interests are broad ranging. She has studied, for example, the relationship between HIV and citizenship, subjectivities and popular culture, narrative theory and practice, and refugee education and politics. I'm extremely pleased to introduce and moderate Corinne's talk because as a health uh, psychologist myself, I very much admired her targeted research that occurs in tandem and is blended with her activism and advocacy. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Corinne Squire giving her talk entitled Curves and Numbers, Silence and Noise, Counteracting COVID-19 Narratives. Hi, thanks very much, Maria. Uh, can you hear me okay? Seems good. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about some dominant COVID-19 narratives that are operating in mainstream UK government and policy discourse, and also at counteracting narrative responses to COVID-19. I'm also going to look at some counteracting narratives coming out of the research I'm involved in currently with Cesar Kalama and Vanessa Kellerman, which is with people living with HIV, that is people who are in some ways pandemic experts, and we're asking them how they're responding to COVID-19. There are questions to ask really about why I might be taking a narrative approach and about whether, given the theme of this conference, my focus is really on psychology. So just briefly on these questions, I'm interested here in how narratives explain things and about how some narratives can indeed be more truthful through their causal accounts and through their language than other narratives. Mark Davis's and Davina Lom's recent book, Pandemics, Publics and Narrative, is I think an excellent account of how people narrate pandemics into meaning. Supporting their arguments, the World Health Organization's approach to COVID-19 has been indeed to narrativize its public briefings. Second, I'm interested here in how the processes of what I'm calling counteracting narratives, which work against dominant or hegemonic narratives, generate effects. And third, I'm going to be assuming that COVID-19 is an expert in transdisciplinarity, working across the fields of health, the economic and the social, as well as the psychological in the accounts of people living with HIV, of their responses to COVID-19, for instance, the interdisciplinarity of COVID-19 seems to mean for some that what was psychological is no longer only psychological. People with HIV have mental health rates, rate issues of about twice those of the general population in the UK, but now their anxiety has a newly collectivized meaning that turns it into social critique. It becomes in itself a narrative of opposition to state palliation of the crisis and of appropriate distress and uncertainty. So for instance, uh, one interviewee, uh, this is not his real name, Joe Bloggs, um, explains how um, this lockdown situation is hitting him. He says, I think it's just because we're all, you know, it's all new territory for us. It's not what we're used to or what we are ready for. So I think for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to not try to distinguish clearly between the psychology of the pandemic and what might lie outside of that. So I want to move now to another question. Is the COVID pandemic a crisis? COVID-19 was classified by the World Health Organization first as a global emergency and then a pandemic. Neither term necessarily suggests crisis, a word which in the Greek indicates a critical moment in a disease or generalizing any critical moment where a decision or a solution is immediately needed. That is, a crisis narrative is one that starts before or in the middle of criticality 
and proceed through events outside of human control or in later uses, potentially through immediate human resolution. Such a narrative does not explain a situation of general, large-scale, extended unsettling, but reasoned and widely agreed socialist response, like entering, going through and emerging from COVID-19 lockdown. Nor does a crisis narrative give an account of situations of current ongoing COVID-19 uncertainties about, for instance, how to find, test, trace, isolate and support effectively, how to treat, what long-term disease effects are, the length of immunity, if any, older people's, men's and BAME people's comparatively extremely uh, high rates of illness and death, possible causes of infection and transmission in children, socioeconomic effects of the disease, these are uncertainties that cannot really be assimilated to crisis. Crisis in early 19th century European and North American fiction and nonfiction writing, where it's often encountered, appeared in relation to now treatable fatal illnesses, especially bacterial illnesses curable by antibiotics, particularly pneumonia. Pneumonia was described by the Canadian physician William Osler as, quote, a self-limited disease, its course uninfluenced in any way by medicine. So here we see, for instance, the pneumonia crisis of Stonewall Jackson, the US Confederate commander in 1865, which led to his death. By analogy, the term crisis is now used to indicate personal crises, including those associated with illness, human and other animal health crises like Ebola, SARS, MERS, BSE, foot and mouth disease, as well as COVID-19, climate and broader environmental crisis, a wide range of socioeconomic events like the refugee crisis and the financial crisis, and as our conference organizers mentioned, disciplinary difficulties, crises in social sciences or indeed sometimes in psychology. Many of these conditions are not out of human control the way pneumonia was and is still to some extent in the case of viral pneumonia. So the viral pneumonia crisis within the COVID-19 pandemic remains a crisis in the first sense of the word. It's a disease crisis which reaches a physiological resolution at present to some extent independent of human intervention. And perhaps the term crisis also applies to other medically intractable aspects of COVID like its generation of intense cyto cytokine storm reactions, sepsis, and uh, the combination of Kawasaki disease and toxic shock syndrome in children. The other crises around COVID-19 and indeed around economies, forced migration and environment that I've just mentioned could be described as critical moments requiring immediate decisional solution, but they might alternatively be described as COVID-19 is by the WHO as emergencies, unforeseen occurrences requiring immediate attention, though not solution which humans can clearly do something about. Discourse analysts have suggested we should study crisis not as inevitability, but as a signifying construction and social practice. Forced migrants and forced migration scholars have often refused the crisis term due to its naturalizing qualities, which suggest that nothing can be done about the situation. To some extent, environmental emergency may already be beyond human control. The term crisis though, can generalize those aspects of uncontrollability something that environmental campaigners like Greta Thunberg recognize when they concentrate on narratives of successful past, present and prefigured future interventions. Pandemics and other serious illness outbreaks are often recoverable situations, given universally understood and historically widely developed and practiced public health principles. The term crisis is not wrong in these situations, but it seems useful to think about how it's working and to remember that a pandemic is also an emergency. In the UK, the dominant discourse in government uh, has been a crisis story, much more extensive than the physiological crises I've mentioned. This story has so far had two powerful uh, government versions. First of all, the government mapped the infection, disease and NHS crisis and moved to resolution of it by the partial mitigating implementation of public health principles alongside the maintenance of education, labor and consumer activity at lowered levels. This was the kind of partial lockdown, um, stay at home, save the NHS, save lives story, ably conveyed by this slogan. This narrative was in fact counteracted by its uh, prior articulation in a narrative of a suppression rather than mitigation lived out by UK citizens themselves, who 10 days before lockdown looked at the case numbers, often comparing to other European countries, and widely did stay home to save the NHS and save lives. They took children out of school, they left university, they absented themselves from retail spaces and they closed offices. This was indeed about the right time for lockdown 
lockdown if the UK was to avoid, like Germany, a long period of exponential community transmission and tens of thousands of deaths. Second, from May the 10th, the government story articulated a new crisis of lockdown associated recession, social inequality and non-COVID related illness and deaths, as if these ineluctably follow like illness and death can follow a virus from lockdown. This crisis is narratively now foreshadowed by government as resolvable via a learning to live with the virus process, a normalizing of return to work, education and consumption and of disease risk tolerance. The virus will be in general circulation, to quote the government's line. Alongside some continuing public health mitigation, test, trace and isolate, just beginning, and all under the slogan, stay alert, control the virus, save lives, which is also now colour coded, as you can see, more benignly. This move is a departure from WHO and general public health guidelines, which emphasise pandemic suppression and elimination in favour of something a bit more vague, more like management. Again, a counteracting narrative accompanied this, first, this second story, as in the first slide I showed, um, immediate ironic and satirical rewritings of the story erupted that evening and the next day. So here are some more social media examples um, alongside uh, in, the right, like, low, in the bottom right corner, just one that was posted up near, I, near where I live. Lived counteracting narratives of continuing to stay home, save the NHS and save lives also appeared in, for instance, opinion polls showing no change from pre-lockdown to now, and people thinking that health outweighs the economy as a, as a policy priority, and in widespread parental, professional, local authority and union resistance to, for instance, reopening schools, again, based very largely on people's articulations of case numbers, COVID-19 reproduction number, R-value, transmissibility and disease burden. The effectiveness of these counteracting narratives is perhaps indicated by government responses that frequently targeted them and still do as pathologically fearful of risk. Um, I think I have a couple more of these to show. Oh, no, let's go back. Um, so the disruption connoted by both of these government COVID-19 crisis narratives, uh, the one about staying alert and the one about staying at home, generated a naturalized conflict first between citizens' health and health service capacity, and then between citizens' health and productivity. You can't have both. These disruptions are thought by some who authorised and authored these narratives to allow for the displacement of existing sclerotic market patterns. In this case, by easing the way towards high risk uh, data science and an accompanying privatisation, which will render nimble and adaptable national health services and possibly social care services also. And this was supposed to happen, and is indeed happening, by a motley array of new and old companies not subject in crisis times to procurement regulations. Certainly these companies have been agile, even alert, in their responses to these crisis narratives, with effects that look, however, less like power relations disruption and more like their reconsolidation around established, sometimes highly reputation damaged, or nepotistically connected corporate players. And these include Deloitte, KPMG, um, G4S, Serco, and Palantir, and faculty. World health narratives of pandemic emergency, by contrast, are stories of rights and solidarities, and apparently older politics, which I'm going to suggest later is actually being reinvented in some ways in current counteracting narratives of COVID-19. At the same time, narratives of crisis as disruption are hardly as new as these UK adoptions of them seem to assume, with a long historical record expressed in pretty similar terms. In fact, you can see this in descriptions of um, European medi medieval uprisings against church of bureauc bureaucracy, similarly characterized as disruptive. So now I wanna move on to look at some of the smaller narratives and counter narratives that have operated within the larger crisis policy narratives. Narratives build meaning across symbol systems, all kinds of them, including slogans, as you can see here, but also some less obvious ones. And I wanna start with curves. The curve is a story Usually time is on the x-axis, and in the COVID-19 case, something like uh, National Health Service critical care beds, for instance here, is on the y-axis. The crisis in these curves, which were produced by government advisors prior to lockdown, lies in the exponentiality of the rise in COVID-19 and the deaths its fall leaves behind. The resolution by some social mitigation, in this case, you can see the different curves there indicate different kinds of mitigation, lies in the possible flattened version of the curve. The term flatten the curve was used in the UK and it is elsewhere to suggest reducing infections and deaths, but it can just mean a time expanded distribution of infections and deaths, 
which is basically what the UK government meant here to avoid overwhelming the NHS. They were meaning that they wanted really to increase the standard deviation of the curve, but preserve the area under the curve. However, um, implementing some flattening social interventions to preserve the NHS would, could, or could in this case, also reduce death numbers. And by mid-March, it was accepted to be politically unacceptable at the, uh, to have deaths at the 500,000 level, which still looks likely to be that required to reach the level of 80% of the population showing antibodies that might confer at least temporary immunity. A curve can also be a counteracting narrative. When most people in the UK use the term flatten the curve, they meant reduce the area under the curve, save lives. And as I mentioned, many people in the UK were already practicing this counteracting narrative well before their practices became part of the official government account. There are many more interesting uses of uh, curve stories. I can't really go into this one from the sun, um, but uh, the point I really want to emphasize here is that popularly curves are being storied in this pandemic in the UK around a concentration on reducing infections and deaths, um, as well as maintaining NHS capacity in a way that counteracted the stealth normalization in hegemonic narratives of a crisis inevitable high and continuing level of deaths by, by a curve that mainly distrib redistributed them. And this is the way the counter narratives appeared in the stories of our research uh, participants who mentioned curves. Here is Joe Bloggs, for instance, discussing the lifting of lockdown. Um, he's going to be looking to be starting to see a curve in things, a decrease in uh, deaths and case numbers, in fact. So, okay, now I want to talk about numbers narratives. The numbers stories were always there, of course, constituting the curves. But as Davis has written recently, COVID-19's numbers seem to be its story, particularly because of the transparency and debate about numbers in this pandemic. Numbers can also be key players in dominant crisis narratives. The government crisis story of excess deaths from untreated illness, um, of numbers of people with mental distress and of levels of educational disadvantage caused by lockdown naturalizes all those figures of social crisis as if they were indeed uncontrollable viruses rather than figures that policy and practice allow. This means that these figures can then be numerically posed against the numbers of COVID-19 deaths and illnesses. Numbers can also themselves mitigate other COVID-19 stories. So for instance, at daily, at daily um, UK government briefings, case numbers and deaths have replaced the flattering case curves that used to show UK levels below those of other European countries. Now, media often bypass this numbers theatre, as David Spiegelholzer has called it, of government announcements of, for instance, self-declared exponential rises in testing, recruitment of very large numbers of new contact tracers, dramatic escalations in PPE. These figures are regularly debunked. Narratives around, based around the higher death rates of BAME people and of people in low paid and risk exposed occupations um, are often also presented by popular media, even when they're pretty technical. So this is a slide you perhaps can't see, but it's a slide around uh, uh, occupation and uh, COVID risk. And this uh, ubiquitousness of numericity really supports David's observations of the particular numbers focus of this pandemic. And of course, also is used in the service of counteracting mainstream accounts of us being all in this together by breaking down the numbers. So I'm suggesting that here that despite uncertainties, the numbers often tell their own truthful and counteracting stories. Among our research participants, many of whom have had to think about numbers and health for a long time, uh, Annabella, for instance, like many others, checks the death and prevalence numbers um, to guide her behaviour. She measures her outgoings once a week and also the number of times she cleans public areas. She says, I know a lot of people have actually died, yeah, it's time, I'm trying to be extra careful not to be the next one, you know. So now I want to now look at another narrative form um, articulated in both hegemonic and counteracting ways in this pandemic, that of silence. Silence isn't really silence unless we're in a vacuum. And so silence in political and policy discourse is really a kind of speaking. It's silence about something. As I mentioned before, the silence about the European national cumulative cases and deaths um, in UK daily briefings. Um, was very loud and it was quickly and loudly criticised. Um, it was at the point just where um, UK deaths overreached those in other European countries. Alert now to such silences 
local government, professional associations and unions ask at every opportunity to see the science, the transmission rates, infectivity curves, curves uh, rates, curves and numbers that constitute more truthful, albeit imperfect narratives. Uh, there are demands everywhere to have and discuss the numbers with confidence intervals in place of strategic silence. But there's another often noted narrative of silence, or at least near silence in this pandemic. Sounds in lockdown, as many have noted, can be very quiet. Uh, at 3 a.m. you may hear nothing that you can discern, maybe a truck far away. About 4, 4.30, that silence starts to be filled by the bird song whose clarity and complexity so many in urban areas have been newly noting. There's been a lot of popular attention to these new sounds of silence in the UK, probably because of the time that some fortunate people have had to exercise in quiet natural environments. More generally, because of people's awareness of this pandemic's relation to climate emergency and humans environmental destruction. How long term and how effective these now powerful experiences will be in future is very debatable. Arundhati Roy tells the story of the viral break as changing the ecosystem of the Indian city and shining a bright light on the so-called development of the first world. Roy ends her narrative with people trying, quote, to stitch our future to our past, to suture India's colonial and post-colonial past into the pandemic. And also with a speculation about a very different, now indefinable, long-term future context to which we can pass through the pandemic portal, either heavily dragging, quote, dead rivers, dead ideas, or with openness, quote, lightly, ready to imagine another world. This narratively imagined possibility is an attractive and often cited one, though Roy is careful not to be too specific or indeed over-optimistic about it. I think the practices arising from and speaking into this silent of open possibility as narrated by our research participants, many of whom had long experience about thinking about pandemic illness as a portal to an uncertain future. I think these accounts are interesting as a guide to the possibilities of counteracting future COVID-19 narratives. Such future accounts were often governed again by people's own numerical and other scientific assessments of the continuing presence of the virus. Um, despite listening to health and government advice, they would be planning their own futures by the numbers. So Annabella, for instance, describes having thought about this, uh, how after lockdown is lifted, she will continue as before. In fact, she has a time for this, she's gonna continue until the end of the year. That's when she may be able to give people a hug. Other future accounts were governed by the simple resumption of prior lives and plans with no change. For instance, one participant, Kai, whose husband was due to come to the UK, that was really all he talked about. Still other accounts recounted the effects the pandemic was having on plans to do different things in your life, to move back to your home country, start a new kind of work, or for Joseph, start dating again. He says, the pandemic has had that effect where it makes me think, oh, why don't I just get over myself and get on with it? Because you know, life is short and it could be nice. As you might expect, there were also counteracting stories of how encounters with the intimations or actualities of COVID mortality would generate new futures of connection with families and friends. But these stories carried with them not only Roy's lightness of imagination, but the weight of deaths. Annabella, for instance, had by early May lost four people close to her. Finally, the counteracting stories of broader future possibilities um, of leaving urban lives that had suddenly been put in question by their empty silence, of a new social justice that would recognize key workers appropriately and would attend to the environment. These were also freighted with sadness and uncertainty. Nicholas told a long, hopeful story of how care workers might be paid and valued properly in the future, but his starting point was doubt. He couldn't say what the future would be, and he raises the strong possibility that things will carry on as normal. At the same time, though, in the coda, Nicholas added uh, a link to something he articulated as much more effective and less silent to the loud and ongoing protests about the Grenfell Tower fire, which had made poverty in that neighbourhood, which was his neighbourhood also, something that could no longer be ignored. So this leads me to think about loudness or noise and what kinds of dominant and counteracting narratives of noise are at play around COVID-19. A lot of apparent noise does, as we've already seen, have a narrative pattern. Many people maybe thought, thought when they first saw the stay alert, control the virus, save lives slogan, that it was just noise. Um, but it clearly was for many other people, not just that. Um, it was not just random buffoonery. It maybe signified confusion and inability 
it may also have allowed, in this case, as many public responses to the announcement suggested, a continuing implicit narrative of culling and herd immunity uh, alongside or in the service of maintaining and refreshing existing structures of capital. Um, all the responses in this, around this slogan in particular, the many, many, many numbers, high numbers of them indicate how seriously people took this very noisy confusion and how they counteracted it with irony and satire, sometimes at scale. So here is um, uh, a building site in Edinburgh, um, where I think it's like, uh, say billionaires, it's a say billionaires slogan. Um, but then there are also a whole load of other social media retreads you can see here. Um, uh, the one about Johnson, it'd be your fault now, control the invisible, take it on the chin, uh, back to work, catch the virus, save the billionaires. Uh, we haven't got a fucking clue what we're doing. And then uh, uh, more kind of pro prosodically, um, the local mayor, for instance, the mayor of uh, Manchester, uh, raising the issue of how case numbers in Manchester relate to this slogan. Uh, and then more recently, Stella governing incompetence costs lives. Uh, this is um, during the Dominic Cummings uh, debacle, and this one, go to Durham, endanger the NHS risk lives. There is some other counteracting noise from the pandemic. The Thursday night applause for key workers. This may be the last uh, week of it. Here's a visual representation of the um, of children's collective counteracting narratives uh, of rainbows as well. The way both these counteracting narratives, the rainbows and the clapping, are publicized across media platforms maybe serves some broader pro-worker, pro-key worker ends, but many have pointed out that clapping for key workers does not equate to supporting proper wages and working conditions, and that this note can mislead. Government support for a le levy um, on migrant health work and uh, health and care workers so that they can uh, they would have to pay more um, for their health care has been was opposed uh, with the narrative of hypocrisy clapping you could say from for instance journalist Piers Morgan who tweeted don't you dare clap for NHS care workers tonight Boris Johnson if you don't abandon this disgusting NHS surcharge on the very people who saved your life. In Among the Noise from last Thursday, if you listened hard, you can probably hear in many places um, clapping for passing delivery vans, children banging pots, neighbours chatting, people coming in and out of Clap for Carers, not staying the whole time. At the end, people coming out to do things like have a drink or do some in-household uh, family football. Most of you have recognised that this weekly activity is largely for us, it's a solidaristic practice. It's a sociality which has perhaps helped us strengthen some other street socialities like physically distanced dance events or whatever. There's much more extensive social noise around COVID-19 too. Many activities at local level to support those shielding, large numbers of small gifts randomly placed on doorsteps, um, physically distanced exercise together, people inventing physically distanced ways to communicate as happened with Ebola, actually like elbow bumps. Uh, people sending more letters, doing Zoom quizzes, Zoom singing, and so on. Despite the claims for renewed collectivities on display here and the focus on the local, I don't think there's anything necessarily progressive or refocused as opposed to just human going on here. But these are certainly lived narratives that counter by recontextualizing the distant practices now required by public health. I think the examples of counteracting narratives of COVID-19 social noise, which were told by people with HIV, are interesting to think about here. They were not entirely positive. Many, unsurprisingly, were accounts of failures in practice to deliver the government narrative of shielding the vulnerable. Martin, who had extensive respiratory problems as well as HIV, and who was uh, self-isolating, pointed out also the limits of faith community narratives faced with the social realities of very extensive new communities to serve. So he talks about the community organizations that he uh, contacted, especially church ones, and uh, he got nothing. Uh, eventually he got a small parcel from a food bank and this was in a situation where government shielding hadn't reached him. However, Martin also points out the value of Clap for Carers community, particularly for somebody isolating like himself. He says he was very surprised. 
uh, the posh people weren't doing it. But he says all of the, you know, all of the different people, all of the different colours and nationalities, they were all hanging out the window banging. And I was really pleased because I was actually convinced that the whole sense of community is gone. But they all do it. And it's quite impressive. I do get quite a tingle when it happens. There are also many other examples narrated by research participants of practiced solidarities. For instance, an intensification of HIV and other community through uh, communication, online communication mostly, and the translation online of solidaristic activities like cooking. So this is Angela talking about how this kind of stuff has stepped up in her support groups, WhatsApp, uh, in her family, and, and also through a kind of collective cooking and recipes in, within the uh, HIV support group. A number of research participants were also newly volunteering by delivering medicine and food parcels via HIV NGOs to shielding or unresourced people. This is Nicholas, who uh, does some, actually does a lot. He frames this quite collectively, but he actually does a lot of this himself. Uh, he's uh, doing deliveries uh, uh, for people who are uh, shielding and self-isolating and have no, no recourse to public funds, as it's called. So I just want to think finally about how all these counteracting narratives maybe can be gathered up together a little. Often, these are resistance narratives and subject to the inevitable co-option of such narratives by their relation to power that Michel Foucault describes. There's no position in exteriority to power. But I've been focusing here on the small breaks that counteracting narratives produce and the resulting potential accumulative shifts under undermining, the, uh, kind of widening the contradictions that exist within power relations. And I think Sarah Ahmed's work on complaint encap encapsulates um, the value of the continuity and persistence of resistance, however much it seems to be exhausting, exhausting itself and even going nowhere. At the same time as this repetitive oppositional or anti-politics is in operation, counteracting narratives also, as I think our research participants account show, generate alternative, tangential, alter political politics, as Hassan Haj calls them. Not redemptive, not transformative, but qualifiedly open to possibility. Finally, I want to look at a broader strategic rights framing of counteracting COVID-19 narratives, as seen, for instance, in WHO COVID-19 documents, which address solidaristic rights and not individual ones. And these narratives are then set against those of marketized health versus the economy trade-offs. I think UK opinion polls are quite interesting in the way that they uh, kind of mirror this. Uh, they do show consistent high levels of support for health priorities over the economy, but they also show a large number of people refusing to prioritise one over the other. That is, rights are being framed not in opposition to each other, um, even if they sometimes can conflict, but as a kind of human set. Uh, we could also look, of course, at the collectivised rights and responsibility narratives recently expressed um, in vast numbers uh, by individual stories told against the personal entitlement narrative of Dominic Cummings. I think our research participants framing of COVID-19 in relation to rights to health, economic security and an environmentally sustainable future also fall within this kind of expanded rights narrative. Akhil Mbembe's recent paper on the universal right to breathe of all living things, alongside their right to have good livable breath and not a, quote, difficult panting life, um, I think is really helpful here too. Um, of course, it also resonates most recently with um, uh, the I can't breathe uh, resistance movement in the US. In the UK, in this septic aisle, we may be enjoying, like Dominic Cummings, a breather beside a river, or we may like the MP for that area, uh, the ex-MP, Helen Goodman, uh, her dad, uh, just a few hundred yards from Dominic Cummings, was at that point uh, struggling to breathe, a struggle that eventually led um, a few days later to his death. We may be like Martin, saving his breath inside and awaiting a food parcel that comes from anywhere or nowhere. Or we may be enjoying local artisanal food and getting fitter, breathing better, walking on paths newly greened by traffic decline. The counteracting narratives I've talked about dissect out these signified and lived COVID-19 inequalities critically again and again, and alterically and provisionally take us sometimes to somewhere else. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much for a, a fascinating talk. Um, so many different levels from the health promotion to personal narratives and the intersection of the two and the silence and the noise and all these dichotomies. Um, uh, just before I get started, I just want to remind people, you probably know by now, but if you have any questions or comments, please use the question and answer box um, for, for Corinne, okay? Uh, so I wanted to ask, I find it really interesting. This is something that you said at the beginning of your talk. You were talking about the slogans of the UK government. And the first slogan was protect the National Health Service, stay home. And then it was shifted to stay alert, control the virus, save lives. And somehow the virus to me, when I think of that second health promotion um, program, it's sort of it's like a virus is in the, the bushes. And if you're not careful, it's going to come out and get you. And I was just wondering, um, can you flesh out, because I see them quite different. I mean, I see the second one, you know, you mentioned um, normalizing, but I also see a difference between the social and the individual responsibility here. And I was wondering if, if um, what your thoughts are on, on the different changes and, and how and why might that affect the narratives? Well, yeah, I think, I think uh, it was, many people responded to this also by pointing this out, Maria, that it's a shift of, it individualizes responsibility, it turns responsibility over to individual citizens, not even, not really collective citizens, but just right. individually, you know, you need to stay alert, you know, which is a, a really quite paranoid slogan in itself, isn't it? You know, it um, recalls many, many kind of Cold War slogans, I think. Um, uh, and controlling the virus, as you say, is also a, a slightly paranoia inducing notion since it's un invisible and un undetectable in any in any in any way um, even when you're infected infected so um yeah i think it's a very uh, useful sloughing off of responsibility you know as the first slide that i showed uh, in indicates you know it's a slide that devolves responsibility and, and, uh, in fact that's increasing in government uh, narratives now the, the notion is that it's a citizenly duty um mm -hmm. uh, and that we all have to take on individually the collectivity of the account has um been really uh, attenuated, I think, particularly by the most recent uh, uh, troubles around uh, the Dominic Karen Cummings narrative of um, following your instinct, doing what's what best. Everyone's quite sure of the Cummings narrative. Maybe you could just take like a, a minute and explain what that is. I've been following it, but I'm not sure everyone else has. Uh, okay, sure. So Dominic Cummings is an unelected chief advisor to. Um, um, Boris Johnson and the architect of the Vote Leave campaign and to some extent of the um, um, last election campaign, not him alone, I mean it's easy to kind of uh, place him in a singular position but he's been quite articulate, he has a very extensive and rambling blog in which he um, describes all his ideas um, and he is indeed the, the architect of the uh, idea that um, uh, government, uh, a kind of anarchistic idea really, that government needs to be replaced by experts, particularly big data experts, who can uh, explain to us all how to live well. Um, and uh, yeah, so he uh, he has a very, uh, un not, not unlike others, but he has a particularly privileged um, position and uh, he uh, uh, left, he, he contravened lockdown regulations by driving 260 miles while at least one of, with in a car with one family member who was probably was thought to have COVID at the time. Um, and then uh, an self-isolating in a second home, which is not what you're, you're not supposed to drive to your country residence. You know, this is not, in fact, it did spread. That was the way that a lot of viral spread happened from the epicenters in London to rural areas like where he went. Um, uh, he later on at the end of quarantine uh, went on a pleasure trip when that was not, um, sanctioned we can now you know the lockdown rules are that we drive somewhere and we can have exercise wherever we want uh, he, he did this uh, at a time when that was not um, advice um, and and the exception that he used was that uh, the regulations say uh, that if you have issues with your your situation you may not be able to stay where you are and this was an exemption brought in to protect people who are experiencing domestic violence right. Uh, he used it to uh, talk about the exceptionality of his difficult childcare situation, which is mm -hmm. why he had to drive mm -hmm. 217 miles. Mm 
Um, so, you know, this is a very uh, difficult narrative to defend within stay at home, save the NHS, save lives. Yeah. Uh, and governments have been tying themselves into knots trying to defend this. Um, yeah. And many public, I mean, I think every, every MP has probably received around a thousand emails as a kind of mean level complaining about this, particularly since many people took this advice as a common, mm. uh, a common duty and did uh, take it as a, a collective responsibility uh, and stuck by it. I mean, it seems my sense from reading The Guardian, that's my source, um, that this is something that's just people have really um, held on to. It's almost like this has angered people more than all the deaths. Um, yeah, maybe, may uh, you know, they, um, uh, I think, I think it's increasingly clear that people are realizing that the deaths were avoidable, almost all of the deaths were avoidable, but it wasn't, it was hard to see that at the time. There was, you know, a lot of international confusion, although yeah. Yeah. really if anybody had followed public health advice, there shouldn't have been, but, um, there was. So uh, this affects really, it's a kind of really loud articulation of public hurt, you know, that people mm -hmm. did this stuff, um, they didn't They didn't see family members close to them, they stayed in their own houses while they had serious illness with children, uh, yeah. they dealt with all this, uh, you know, so this exceptionalism is quite... Uh, yeah. dangerous for government for any for any organization trying to deliver public health really which yeah. is public by its definition um yeah. yeah 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 but i think you know the the rate of, of fury about it is also an index of uh the kind of commitment public commitment to uh collective narratives um mm -hmm. which was already there you know as i said mm -hmm. people locked down before there was lockdown you know they recognized what was needed and they did it and to save the National Health Service, which is so important in the collective of... of it is, but also to save yeah. lives. Yeah. I mean, this happened with Ebola, you know, people uh, who've got experience of the, any of the Ebola outbreaks, you know, are very struck by how people in those communities learn quickly what's going on and what they need to do. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't need to be telling them. You don't, you know, they, they quickly understand and do it. Um, yeah. People, people can do this, yeah. I mean, it kind of um, reminds me of something else that you said that I think is really interesting, how the phrase flatten the curve or even the curve visually means something very different to the person on the street and something very different from the policy makers. And I, I think it's really, I thought that was a really good point that you brought out. It's, it's not really, do you want to just say a couple of words? Yeah. Got a useful ambiguity because you know formally speaking it does just mean you know change the standard deviation but of course most people when they hear that phrase do mean that a decrease in the curve is going to decrease the area that is the deaths under it you know so um uh, the government played on that ambiguity uh for quite a long time really um uh, because they were not convinced at the po at some point that you know immunity was not the way to go they thought that might be feasible and i think few people now Think that that right, is right. But they took an extraordinarily long time to learn any lesson from SARS, MERS, anything. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. Prime Minister said that last night, I think. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, we didn't take on the lesson to SARS, yeah, you know, which is the closest related virus. So, whereas a lot of people did, you know, I think it also shows um, people's reactions, the kind of counter narratives that I've been talking about, shows people's very good gr grasp of evidence and uh, numbers and uh, curves and, and values of various kinds and their complete commitment to getting to grips with them you know yeah. it's not it's not like that i mean okay there are some conspiracy theories but many people have now become as mark davis has said kind of covid19 numbers experts um you know yeah, keen really interesting yeah okay i'd just like to move to a, a couple of the questions so this is um um from M. Waka Penda, um, is there a sense from your analysis that the coronavirus seems to have a certain kind of personality? <laughs> if so, um, what would one say is the voice or some of the voices that they're hearing um, from this virus? And what kind of number is this virus assuming? So I guess, is there a personality and, and what, what's it saying? What's it communicating? Do we, do we see the virus that way? What's the narrative? Is there a narrative? Is I, I, the narrative? 
Always. I think there's a, I mean, there are various kind of satirical takes on this. And then there's also one that is very re reminiscent of how people um, figured HIV, you know, this horrifying thing, you know, this, this awful thing. And, um, you know, the people are very aware of what this, as with HIV, of what it looks like to die with this virus. Yeah. You know? It's not just being ill and recovering. It's not just being seriously ill and recovering, given that your organs may be damaged lifelong. You know, it's, yeah. uh, I think this notion that it's a, a pretty horrifying virus um, is, and is also a kind of counteracting notion because at the beginning it was presented as something you can so, uh, take on the chin. Um, yeah, right. Live through. It's hard to live through, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, I think uh, uh, you know, people have understood the, the they personalized it in a way that really um, uh, takes on its biological realities as far as we know them. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is a comment question from Marco. Thanks a lot for your multi-layered presentation. Can you please elaborate more on the ways in which the pandemic narratives may differ, differently affect different audiences? For instance, the stay in shelter message assumes that people can stay home instead of having to leave their shelter and go to work despite the virus. Or the stay home message for elderly in retirement homes when lots of these sites were sources for, of infection. So. Yeah, that's a very um, important point, I think. Um, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the stakeholding in stay at home was very extensive, even among people with no means of support outside casual work. You know, uh, uh, so many people had to go onto what's called universal credit in the UK, where you can get a loan, but you have to wait five weeks for a payment. Um, it's very difficult. Um, many, many people did this, uh, you know, they took it very seriously. Um, despite the financial damage it was it was doing them. I think, um, and the emotional damage, obviously. I think for older people, um, uh, this has been um, uh, both uh, uh, seemed over, um, over protective in some cases for some people, especially people who feel that, um, you know, they may be locked in their entire lives now. Yeah. Uh, that's a pretty daunting thought. But at the same time, you know, the. Um, the initial account of older people dying, older people were the first people who were dying, um, was always that they had underlying conditions. And this became a kind of tragic foretaste that if you had any underlying condition, really, or were a certain age, you know, you were gone, really. In fact, care home residents were asked to sign do not resuscitate notices um, way before there were any cases in hospitals. Uh, and these notices are not written, they're, they're designed for when your heart stops not really for when you just need some oxygen but they were used to, to stop uh, older people in care homes having any treatment at all and not just older people other people in care homes it's been a shocking percentage um of which i can't now recall of deaths of people with uh mental disabilities in care homes right. just adults um yeah. so uh, um uh, you know it was a uh, uh, that was that was a save the nhs move to um you know basically consign uh, people with uh comorbidities um uh, to dying really. Um, yeah, as, as you say it, I'm thinking too, it's also kind of an individual coping way. Okay, it's them. Other people are at risk. Keep the fear sure. at bay. It's not me. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I think this was, you know, people again were not looking. Uh, other countries have been better at looking uh, cross nationally, I think, at what's going on. You know, it was clear from Italy that. Um, towards the time that the UK started its lockdown, oh, younger people were already being hospitalised and dying. You know, viral load increases, and uh, if people are exposed multiple multiple times, and it will kill you when you're forty or fifty or whatever. You don't you don't have to wait. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But but UK was pretty uh, you know poor uh, given the kind of Brexit context, given all kinds of context, was pretty poor at looking at any other uh, country. Also, kind of just. Um, consequence of its, uh, uh, you know, poor post-colonial uh, mm -hmm. framing of the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so we have a question here uh, from Martin. Um, the story of numbers, I find that fascinating, how numbers and graphs are used to tell particular stories. 
I'm thinking about the uh, anonymity of numbers that somehow becomes personalized or made personally relevant with the narrative. Is there maybe also a form of uncanniness involved that we feel when confronted with numbers and graphs? In a form of, um, I'll read the whole thing and if you want me to repeat parts, just let me know. In a form of uncertainty, whether these numbers pertain to us or not, or worse, to what extent those numbers pertain to us? And then Martin says, I'm not articulating my thoughts clearly here, partially because I don't have them clearly, have them clear. <laughs> Sorry, but fascinating. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. I think there is, there are different ways to think about this. I mean, one is certainly what I've been saying, you know, that, um, uh, uh, citizens as scientists are quite powerful narrators uh, when they, and they get when they get their grips on data you know obviously there are uncertainties and as people now know confidence limits and so on but um that's that's one important thing I think that you know despite the turn to expertise was also a turn to expertising yourself and and that has happened with other pandemics it certainly happened with HIV where a lot of um uh, science research was driven by the organizations of people with HIV themselves so that's um, really important to, to see and recognize, I think. And at the same time, I think you're right that, you know, 60,000 deaths, 50,000 deaths is overwhelming. And um, uh, that, yeah, there's something uh, uncanny about, about that, uh, that reel that comes to you. Um, how many people choke to death in an ICU? You know, it's a, it's a lot, uh, it's uh, unimaginable. People often say it's unimaginable. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, they are imagining it. That's kind of what's uncanny about it. They're doing both. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of um, another talk and just, just relating to the idea of the numbers and graphs and charts and just discussing the sort of the real lack of visual images and how those might frame or not frame the narratives that we have about this pandemic. Do you have any ideas about that given your health background? I mean, there, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there is a lot of kind of photographic witnessing now. The BBC has a site where you could put your photo and your account of somebody you loved who's died. Um, there are a lot of, you know, they, they used, to, it became too many. There used to be um, parades of photos and stories on the news. And then um, that just became, that would have taken the entire channel and more, you know, so it, uh, it started to be pulled back from. But I think there's quite a lot of, um, interest in documenting that, um, uh, you know, in more personal ways than just that, the numbers as well. Um, yeah, I do think that the, 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 the folk fastening onto numbers by public, by the public is important. You know, it's, uh, it indicates a really strong level of engagement and understanding mm. uh, or attempt to that, uh, which is not going to be, you know, thrown off really. I mean, you can, you can understand one story and then another story and you get very exhausted from stories, personal stories, and, you, and they become overwhelming and you start to um, stuff them off in a way. Um, numbers too, but maybe numbers give you some other kind of explanatory portal. Yeah, I like the phrase you use, the development of expertise of people and, and yeah. um, learning how to read numbers and know everyone knows what the R naught is and yeah. all those things. So. That's, yeah. that's quite a, an interesting dynamic yeah. that you brought out that sometimes the people seem to be, you know, more knowledgeable about what needs to happen than yeah. the public health. Um, Definitely, um, yeah. And I think that book I mentioned, I should mention again, Mark Davis and Davina Long's book on pandemics, publics and narrative, which has uh, some accounts of that happening around, uh, I think, H1N1 as well, and diff different... Um, uh, smaller reach uh, pandemics. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Okay. This is um, a, a question comment from Anna. Hi, Corinne. Wonderful talk. Thanks. You discuss among the many narratives and counter narratives, the curves as one of the narratives that might potentially save lives and it's being used by citizens in the UK. I was wondering whether the flatten the curve and the reaching the peak narratives and metaphors got any criticism when used by the authorities. Here in Spain, 
social mm. media was flooded with memes on curves and the peak as used by government officials, particularly when they kept saying we were flattening the curve, reaching the peak for over a month every day in every single public intervention. Does it compare to the tension between official slogans and counter slogans in the UK, perhaps? Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's actually a kind of second use of the curve, the flatten the curve story that was kind of slid into. Um, uh, you know, the first use in the UK was this perspective curve that might be flattened by social interventions, uh, non pharmaceutical interventions, as they were called. Um, uh, so that that would that would look at the overall just that flatten the curve in that sense meant the overall distribution of the curve later on as exponential rise started to flatten off uh, then flatten the curve meant uh, uh, reaching the peak or flatten, flattening the slope basically and a, a, a negative slope um, and it was actually that was used both by government um, uh, but it was used in a more uh, WHO type way by a lot of um, popular commentators who were concerned that the curve had to flatten down to, to suppression, suppression levels. You know, the government has been consistently focused on mitigation rather than on suppression and elimination of, of, of COVID-19. But, you know, when, when the, 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 the second version of flatten the curve started to have uh, currency, I think... Um, uh, public at least use of that phrase started to be about um, uh, suppression, really bringing that curve down to New Zealand type levels. Um, I think people no longer look at that. I think they're kind of dispirited, you know, by um, the failures, exactly as you say, the failures of government flatten the curve measures in that sense. People are pretty dispirited. Um, yeah, they maybe now talk about test, trace, isolate and support as the means eventually to deliver that kind of um, new, Jeruse new Jerusalem of eradication. Right. right. Uh, but it seemed quite distant in the UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with your term eventually. <laughs> um, I just want to kind of um, go back to something that Marco uh, said in his um, comment and that I've been thinking about as well. I'm very curious what you have to say. You know, so on the one hand, um, you know, we have the uh, back to the elderly who are at higher risk or at really high risk, you know, especially old age homes and being told to stay in place and, you know, just, you know, raging infection there. And, you know, and I'm sure this is in every country where people have not been able to see their parents or their grandparents. And I know in Canada, there were cases where people weren't even allowed to go into the parking lot to wave um, for whatever, well, I, I suspect to prevent groups from congregating in, in the parking lots. Um, and so I'm kind of curious with uh, what you're thinking about um, and this is actually a question that came up in my talk that I kind of misunderstood due to the terminology, but since I have a health um, um, scholar here, I'm gonna ask it because I think it's a really important one. Uh, I think Carmen asked it. Um, what are your thoughts about kind of, um, you know, the rights of the elderly to decide if they don't have a, maybe if and depending on, on their cognitive capacity and their families on um, seeing each other, you know? Uh, so some people might not have long to, to live and we can't wait for a vaccine. And um, maybe people have the right to make the decision to see their parents or grandparents or brothers or sisters. And I wonder what you yeah, thought. Maybe that. These are kind of variations played out within um, a situation that is basically constructed, you know, old age as risk, you know. Um, well, obviously, age is a risk here. I mean, you know, the immune systems senesce quickly, not only at the age of 70, actually. Um, but, you know, if you think about it, in, and which is people have a little bit, in the same way as you might think about disability and the social construction of disability, you know, there's a larger issue here about constructing um, safety for citizens, you know, 
rather than asking them to, again, shift responsibility to themselves to make these decisions. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, saying, well, you chose this, it's you know, your, your, um, uh, you're, you're choking to death now because you chose to de deal with this, you know. Um, I think that's uh, uh, a poor shifting of responsibility really, when it's completely feasible to think about ways of uh, generating COVID ready or COVID safe environments for older people. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to look a bit different from others, um, but maybe we would take on some of those difficulties uh, in different age groups as well. I think that, you know, the, se the, the sectioning of the population out into um, basically productive groups and unproductive groups is, you yeah. know, what's happening now is a quite um, uh, difficult, difficult uh, move. Yeah, I don't know. That hasn't really answered what you said, but... Yeah, but, but it's, you know, I mean, I think the point that you made about productive and unproductive groups is um, really key to the narrative of COVID here. And I think it's very interesting how the construction of age um, has impacted here, where here we have a group of people that it's, we have, you know, there's a very paternalistic in some senses, um, you know, we know best and you need to isolate yourself now potentially for two years. You can't see anybody because we, until we have a vaccine. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested, I haven't really looked at how um, countries that have succeeded, like, well, you know, had a difficult epidemic like South Korea have managed uh, to address, you know, the social spaces for older people. I haven't really looked at that, but it'd be interesting to look at. I don't think they're doing it quite like here. But, mm -hmm. um, it would be an interesting, uh, possibility and, yeah yeah I mean it'd be interesting to see what the rates of old age homes are are, are old age homes are dominant as and as large and as privatized right. in a country right. like that I, I'm, I'm I don't know but that could be interesting as well sure do you see any overlaps of um the narrative of um COVID with um you know since you mentioned it with HIV and the way people are experiencing it, because yeah, so a lot of people have said, you know, people especially who've lived with HIV for a long time remember living with, um, you know, a strong sense of their own mortality just just around the corner. Even people recently diagnosed have that sense. It's a fatal illness, you know. So yeah. if not treated, that's what happens. Um, and I think also, you know, a lot of people have said. In, in, in the groups that we've spoken to, and um, we've done this actually in the UK, but also in Zambia and Brazil, you know, people have said, we can teach you, <laughs> we can teach you about living with uncertainties. And we know how to do this. And we know how to be patient also, you know, with restriction. Um, mm. Mm -hmm. people, people have learned that kind of thing. And perhaps, although this is perhaps less prevalent now among people with HIV, but people also did learn, as I said, to be citizen scientists. And a number of people have said that, you know, act actually activists have said, this is what people, you know, more generally need to do now is to learn that kind of lesson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also thinking of some of the things that I'm reading in the newspapers of people like, um, you know, wanting uh, people that have had COVID not to live in their building, not to get food, and even the shunning of healthcare workers. And this yeah. us them kind of dilemma yeah. or yeah. dialectic seems to be happening as well. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. That's yeah, um, yeah. Some people have been reporting that in the UK, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, not really related to the realities of yeah. infection and immunity and reinfection or anything um, in the same way that it was never related to transmission transmissibility around hiv you know which is right very, very yeah. difficult actually it's right. a difficult yeah. 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 yeah 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 okay we have another um question comment here so i'll just read it um um, I think it was Willie. I think he said his name was Willie. At his oh, yeah, house. hi. <laughs> <laughs> Email me earlier, yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of locating narratives that one might consider as being more dominant, have you been able to locate, say, within the UK context, if the narratives are more dominated by science or politics or faith? Where would one be able to see or locate education narratives fit? 
especially given the discourse around reopening schools. So it sounds like sort of two questions. How, how is the narrative dominated in the UK, is it science, politics, or faith? I think the second ones is about the opening of schools and how do we understand that? I think, you know, there's been a lot of conflict really quite uh, under underexposed between different elements of the health service and government, um, and also between government and civil service. There are various elements of the health service that have basically had to um, uh, fit their narratives around political uh, requirements. Uh, quite a lot of the narratives were actually retrofitted to um, pragmatic factors like um, the failure of the UK to continue to have a pandemic plan and the under provision of the UK in terms of PPE, the absolute failure of the UK to have a testing capacity. Um, all of which happened during uh, the last 10 years, really, because um, prior to that, the UK had many of these provisions. So uh, very often you would hear policy and political narratives um, related to that. For instance, the deputy chief medical officer, a woman called Den Jenny Harris, announced um, at one point uh, that we were not doing any more testing, except for people in hospital with cases. Uh, uh, this is at the time when the WHO was saying test, 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 which is a standard strategy if you have tests. So she said we were not doing this because it was not appropriate for the UK, it might be more appropriate for third world countries. Okay. Um, but in fact, you know, the UK had no test capacity hardly. So that was it. They also stopped um, test and trace um, at a point when case numbers in the community were becoming high and they just couldn't work out how to scale up test and trace. Although, uh, you know, that would actually have been a possible thing to do was there were political reasons not to do that because they wanted to centralize um, uh, authority over this epidemic rather than devolve to more politically diverse local authorities that might um, be in conflict with government. So they wanted to keep a whole government wanted to keep a hold of test and trace and so on. Um, and PPE to some extent, rather than devolving, including to you know environmental health officers, public health officers. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, I think one of the first things that happened was that 28,000 community workers were recruited to go house to house and find out who had symptoms and ask them to test, get them to test. Um, you know, obviously 28,000 could have been more, but you know, that was amazing commitment and um, probably drawing on, you know, long-term community health expertise in South Africa, all of which was just uh, ignored in the UK. Right. Um, so um, I would say that in relation to your question, there, there's been a big struggle really between, you know, completely uh, standard, well-validated public health approaches, education approaches also to this, um, and then the exigencies of government holding on to a certain kind of power and also dealing yeah. with their own prior failures to resource. Yeah, no, I think that's that's well put. There's a lot of like a shroud of fog around a lot of this. Well, that's not necessary to do this because we yeah. can't actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, because, you know, if we do, we're going to lose a certain kind of political authority that we'd like to hold on to. It's, yeah. it's a terrible reason for, for killing people, you know. Yeah. But that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, did you have any thoughts about the education school reopening in, in this context? That's a pretty think, big question. Every, everybody says, everybody of any sense in public health says that the levels of new cases, 9,000, 10,000 a day, are too high right. to allow for this to happen and, and for tra contact tra testing and tracing. You know, it's too high. You know, other countries have done this at a much lower level. Um, I'm trying to remember what the levels in Germany were. Something like 400 a day or something when they started to lift up lockdown. You know? right. So uh, levels of, yeah. of new cases and just also of deaths still high. Um, it's nothing to do with the R number here, well, although that's important, but it's actually to do with the absolute case numbers. And I think a lot of people in the UK are very aware of those numbers. You know, you hear people saying deaths are still X, uh, yeah. you know. Um, and that's why I think uh, numbers are important for public, uh, uh, for, for people's, empowerment narratively actually yeah. yeah yeah it comes back to kind of numeral liter literacy again one of the themes again how, how people have taken that into their own hands and yeah. created some resistance against some of the political um, narratives that are being propagated um, so we have another comment question here from Marco G. And I just want to remind people I'm not saying last names on, on purpose because we actually don't have your permission to say your names on YouTube. So that's why I'm doing it this way. Um, following up on Anna's mentioning of memes, there are some wonderfully funny examples of memes in the social media 
that somewhat made fun of the governmental biopolitics. Do you think that humor can represent a strategy to develop counter narratives, especially against the hegemony of science based narratives, which have often neglected social or minority issues? Yeah. Sure. I mean, we could say, is that really science when it neglects those issues? I guess a lot of scientists would say not. Uh, in the UK case, there is there is a scientific advisory group and there is also what's called now an independent scientific <laughs> advisory group of uh, scientists who've um, decided to you know, commit to these kinds of issues and not, uh, not finesse in terms of what government is asking them about. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think you're, you're right that... Um, uh, where science uh, ignores uh, these kinds of inequities and inequalities, especially, then uh, you know the memes are useful. The memes are useful anyway. I, I think they've been quite um, powerful. Uh, uh, you know, they're very condensed kind of stories in themselves. Usually, the, the slogans, anyway. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, I think I think they've been um, uh, very helpful. And I think that came out in some of your talk as well, the humor aspects as well, as, as ways of resistance and pointing out the absurdity of, of some of the official stories. I mean, it's a difficult time for public uh, protest, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> this is a difficult yeah. thing to do currently, uh, although it's happened street by street. I know Dominic Cummings Street has been um, besieged by irate neighbors out there shouting at him, um, which some people have seen as harassment, but it's actually, uh, quite quite difficult to establish a kind of um, pro a, a conversation of protest at the moment. Yes. Not many spaces that you can do that in, um, except maybe you know online and so on. But otherwise, right. difficult. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much for this really wonderful talk on um, curves and numbers and silence and noise of of of. Uh, in the narratives and counter narratives of, of uh, COVID-19. It's, you know, as a health psychologist, I find it fascinating how these, these things can mean very different things, even numbers. I mean, numbers can lie or they can tell the truth. Um, and so uh, I think that's uh, something so important to be mindful of. So um, just before we go, I'd like to thank Anna Lenga for helping moderate our session here. And then again, I want to thank uh, you, Karine, on behalf of um, the co-organizers and, and the participants as well. And thank you to the participants for being here. Thanks very much. It was really interesting. Thank mm -hmm. you.